Chapter 7 Warnings on the Short Path The advocates of the short path teach that with its entry, all necessity for the toils, processes, and disciplines of the long one ceases. They are right, but they are rarely right when it comes to applying this statement to individual cases, for then it is nearly always applied prematurely. The results are then disastrous at most, disappointing at least. Most beginners are not usually ready for the entire short path. They ought not attempt more than its simpler practices, such as those concerned with recollection of the quest and remembrance of the overself. If they attempt more advanced exercises, such as self-identification with the overself or cultivation of the attitude which rejects evil's reality, they are likely to put themselves in a false self deceived position. That is, the attempt to ignore the ego does not eradicate it, but merely alters its pattern. If it seems to be absent, because the divine is present, the transformation has taken place in imagination, not in actuality. It would be better to postpone the advanced part until they have done enough preparatory work on the long path, and thus cleanse their emotions, develop mental controls, and balance their temperament. The long path is unutterably irksome, whereas the short path is gloriously attractive. The one is associated with toil and suffering. Its emblem is the cross. The other is associated with peace and joy. Its emblem is the sun. Yet those who would prematurely desert the one for the other will find their hopes frustrated in the end however enthusiastic and rapturous the experience may be in the beginning. This is because nature, the overself, will not let them enjoy permanently what must be taken into every part of their being, properly cleansed and prepared to absorb it, with the being itself properly equilibriated to endure the experience of absorption without stimulating the ego. Those who are ill-qualified for the short path who come to it in order to escape the tiresome disciplines of the long path, who want a sudden and swift enlightenment without having to pass through the gradations of slowly preparing themselves for it, usually find themselves thrown back in the end. There are certain other dangers to which enthusiasts for the various short paths are exposed. They read books devoted to descriptions of the attainments and goals, and become captivated by what they read and charmed by what they are taught. Then they begin to imitate what they can and to imagine what they cannot. In the end, they fall into ego-centered fantasies and ego-fostered deceptions. They think they are more exalted in attainment than they really are. But so subtle is this disguised spiritual egoism that they are quite unaware of their peril until disaster deflates it. The danger of becoming too self-centered exists on the long path, but the danger of deifying the self exists on the short one. If he begins with the short path, he may feel that whatever is accomplished is self-accomplished, and thus subtly, insidiously, his ego will triumphantly reassert or keep its supremacy. But if he begins with the long path, and after all his efforts, reaches an inconclusive result. The consequent despair may crush his ego and point up his dependence on and need of grace. The introduction of the short path ought not to be mistimed. It ought not to be introduced until enough work has been done to prepare a moral and intellectual basis for it and enough balance secured. Then only will its capacity to lead the seeker toward a glorious climax of his quest be actualized. If introduced too early, it merely stimulates egotism, animates intellectual pride, or stimulates illumination. The dangers inherent in the short path have to be noted and even proclaimed. The self-identification with the divine leads to the idea that since it is sinless, the practicer is sinless too, and whatever he does is right. Such an idea can come only to those who unconsciously seek excuses to justify the satisfaction of their desires. 
to them the long path with its exhortations to self-control and self-discipline is something to be evaded. Another danger is the conceited belief that since the divine is ever-present, the goal has been attained and nothing further need be done. No study, no meditation, and of course, no ascetic regimes. It is such dangers which were part of the reason why in former times the hidden teaching was not communicated to any persons until their character was first secretly and carefully tested for maturity and their mind was tested for fitness. This caution was an existent in Christian circles as in Hindu ones. Today, since it has largely been broken down, the results are to be seen in the West as well as in the East, among solitary obscure individuals as well as among publicized cults. They are to be seen in mental derangement and immoral license, in parrot-like prattle and charlatanic deception. The short path schools are correct in asserting that if we gain the oversell, we shall also gain the period of heart and goodness of character which go with it. But they omit to point out that such a gain will be quite temporary if we are unable to remain in the overself. Without this conquest of the lower nature, no enlightenment can remain, either a lasting or an unmixed one. And without suitable disciplines, no such conquest is possible. This is one reason why it is not enough to travel the short path. The claim that if the true self is found, all the qualities and attributes which pertain to it will also be found, naturally and automatically, at the same time is a valid one. But could the qualities and attributes of the lower nature thrive or even exist in that rarefied air? They would instantly be displaced by the higher ones. But what is overlooked by or unknown to the makers of this claim? is that the period of such displacement would and could only be a temporary one. Nature never leaps toward what she will eventually bring about, Goethe announces, and truly, as soon as the impetus which launched him into the deep waters of the spirit exhausts itself, as it must if he is still unpurified, unprepared, and undeveloped, the man will be thrown back to the place where he belongs, his illumination will not have enough basis to be securely established and so will turn out to be only a passing glimpse. Holding on to awareness of the over-self automatically brings with it control over the body's appetites and desires. This is one of the benefits of success on the short path. But such easy, spontaneous control lasts no longer than the awareness. There is no need to think twice to understand that this is a dangerous doctrine. If a man believes that he is already divine and has nothing more to gain in that way, pitfalls lie ahead of him. First, self-deception leading to spiritual arrogance. Second, indolence leading to lack of any effort to purify character and better the mind. The end could be a smug dwelling in illusion, very far from the divine reality it is supposed to be. Out of such illusions step forth the ambitious leaders of little groups or large movements, claiming special knowledge, power, vision, authority, even messiahship. The short path devotee, who believes he has nothing to do and can leave all to the master or to the oversell, believes wrongly. Such spiritual idleness may lull him pleasantly into a thin contentment, but this is not the same as real inner peace. 1. By grappling in the right attitude with difficulties as they come, or by keeping the personal will submissive during test and obedient during temptations. Beware of losing balance in the study of metaphysical truth or in the practice of the short path, of imagining that you are surpassing the intellect and getting spiritually illumined. Beware of getting intellectually drunk with your own self-importance and emotionally intoxicated with your own self-glorification. Such study can be very stimulating. Beware of coming to believe that you have found the divine in a single flash, overnight. Have you really become God? 
Is omnipotence really yours? He has not attained who is conscious that he has attained. For this very consciousness cunningly hides the ego and delivers him into its power. That alone is attainment which is natural, spontaneous, unforced, unaware, and unadvertised, whether to the man himself or to others. It is a fallacy to think that this displacement of the lower self brings about its complete substitution by the infinite and absolute deity. This fallacy is an ancient and common one in mystical circles and leads to fantastic declarations of self-deification. If the lower self is displaced, it is not destroyed. It lives on but in strict subordination to the higher one, the over-self the divine soul of man. And it is this latter, not the divine world principle, which is the true displacing element. They consider themselves to be free from the possibility of committing sin since they are joined to the divine consciousness. They do not regard the moral codes of society as binding upon them since they are a law unto themselves. Whatever they do, it can only be right. The dangers here, of course, first, that the ego's desire may only too easily be mistaken for the divine ordinance, and second, that all things are permitted to them. Since they feel that they are in a state of grace, there is no longer any controlling power to judge, criticize, or curb their acts. No outside help to warn them when they go perilously astray. Because good and bad have no meaning on the plane where there is no opposition, no struggle between them. The enlightened man who taught others to ignore this opposition and abandon this struggle, who told them that to do what they will is the whole of the law, would thereby prove his own lack of enlightenment. In other words, he would be a dangerous imposter or a mere intellectual. It is a matter that comes to the careful observer's attention that in groups or societies, in ashrams or institutions, where what is practiced corresponds to the short path, however roughly and imperfectly, the results are very mixed and often saddening to the leaders. Where no attempt is made to bring in the long past corrective work, where there is no striving for self-improvement, the end is a confused one some satisfactions, but more disappointments. The philosophic solution, balance the paths. The advocates of the long path claim that the mind must be trained and the heart must be cleansed before enlightenment is possible. The advocates of the short path claim that it is sufficient to deny the ego and affirm the higher self. The philosopher studies the facts revealed by observation and research and concludes that the methods of both schools must be united if enlightenment is not only to be lastingly attained, but also not to fall short of its perfect state. If we think I strive to become one with God, or I am one with God, we have unconsciously denied the statement itself, because we have unconsciously set up and retained two things, the I and God. If these two ultimately exist as separate things, they will always exist as such. If, however, they really enter into union, then they must always have been in union and never apart. In that case, the quest of the underself for the overself is unnecessary. How can these two opposed situations be resolved? The answer is that relativity has taught us the need of a double standpoint the one relative and practical and constantly shifting, the other absolute and philosophical and forever unchanged. From the first standpoint, we see the necessity and must obey the urge of undertaking this quest in all its practical details and successive stages. The second one, however, we see that all existence, inclusive of our own and whether we are aware of it or not, dwells in a timeless motionless now, a changeless, actionless here, a thingless, egoless void. The first bids us work and work hard at self-development, in meditation, 
metaphysics, and altruistic activity. But the second informs us that nothing we do or abstain from doing can raise us to a region where we already are and forever shall be in any case. And because we are what we are, because we are sphinxes with angelic heads and animal bodies, we are forced to hold both these standpoints side by side. If we wish to think truthfully and not merely half-truthfully, we must make both these extremes meet one another. That is, neither may be asserted alone and neither may be denied alone. It is easier to experience this quality than to understand it. This is puzzling indeed and can never be easy. But then, were life less simple and less paradoxical than it is, all its major problems would not have worried the wisest men from the remotest antiquity until today. Such is the paradox of life, and we had better accept it. That is, we must not hold one standpoint to the detriment of the other. These two views need not oppose themselves against each other, but can exist in a state of reconciliation and harmony when their mutual necessity is understood. We have to remember both that which is ever becoming and that which ever is in being. We are already as eternal as immortal, as divine, as we ever shall be. But if we want to become aware of it, why then we must climb down to the lower standpoint and pursue the quest in travail and limitation. The Vedantins, Zen Buddhists, Christian scientists, and even to a certain extent Ramana Maharshi and Sri Krishna Menon said that self-identification with the reality Thinking of this identification constantly would be enough to attain the spiritual goal. This is called the short path. The opposite schools of Pantanjali's yoga, the Roman Stoics, and the Southern Buddhist reject this claim and say that it is necessary to thin down the ego and purify the mind by degrees through disciplines, exercises, and practices. This is called the long path. The philosophic method is to combine both of these schools of thought synthetically and with the explanation that both are necessary to complete each through the other, and that it depends upon the stage where the aspirant is as to which school is necessary for him or her to emphasize personally. Beginners need to give more weight to the hard effort of the yoga school, but advanced persons need to give it to the Vedanta point of view because in their case, much of the ego thinning and mental-emotional cleansing has already been done. Those who depend solely on the short path without being totally ready for it take too much for granted and make too much of a demand. This is arrogance. Instead of opening the door, such an attitude can only close it tighter. Those who depend solely on the long path take too much on their shoulders and burden themselves with a purification work which not even an entire lifetime can bring to an end. This is futility. It causes them to evolve at a slower rate. The wiser and philosophic procedure is to couple together the work on both paths in a regularly alternating rhythm, so that during the course of a year, two totally different kinds of results begin to appear in the character and the behavior in the consciousness and the understanding. After all, we see this cycle everywhere in nature, and in every other activity she compels us to conform to it. We see the alternation of sleep with waking, work with rest, and day with night. Ramana Maharshi was quite right. Pruning the ego of some faults will only be followed by the appearance and growth of new faults. Of what use is it so long as the ego remains alive? Hence the failure of mankind's moral history to show any real progress over the past 3,000 years, despite the work of Buddha, Jesus, and other messiahs. The correct course, which has always been valid for the individual, is just as valid for all mankind. Get at the root, the source, the ego itself. But although Maharshi was right, his teaching gives only part of truth's picture. 
presented by itself and without the other part. It is not only incomplete, but may even become misleading. By itself, it seems to indicate that there is no need to work on our specific weaknesses, that they can be left untouched while we concentrate on the essential thing, rooting out the eagle. But where are the seekers, who can straight away and successfully root it out? For the very strength of purpose and power of concentration needed for this uprooting will be sapped by their faults. When the overself is present in a man's consciousness, it is present in all his thoughts and actions. They are then under its rule. They proceed from it. The man does not have to seek for any particular virtues, for all can and will then come of themselves as needed. Only then is any virtue solidly established. But until this presence is permanently secured, It would be foolish to cease working upon oneself, correcting oneself, improving oneself. A merely intellectual and theoretical acquaintance with this doctrine is inadequate. It is necessary, until then, to practice a coexistence of short and long paths. It is quite true, as the extremist advocates of the short path, like Zen, say that this is all that is really needed that no meditation in the ordinary sense, no discipline, no moral striving, and no study are required to gain enlightenment. We are now as divine as ever we shall be. There is nothing to be added to us. No evolution or development of our real self is possible. But what these advocates overlook is that in the absence of the labors listed, The short path can succeed only if certain essential conditions are available. First, a teaching master must be found. It will not be enough to find an illumined man. We will feel peace and uplift in his presence, but these will fade away after leaving his presence. Such a man will be a phenomenon to admire and an inspiration to remember, not a guide to instruct, to warn, and to lead from step to step. Second, we must be able to live continuously with the teaching master until we have finished the course and reached the goal. Few aspirants have the freedom to fulfill the second condition, for circumstances are hard to control, and fewer still have the good fortune to fulfill the first one for a competent, willing, and suitably circumstanced teaching master is a rarity. These are two of the reasons why philosophy asserts that a combination of both the long and short paths is the only practical means for a modern Western aspirant to adopt. If, lured by the promise of sudden attainment or easy traveling, he neglects the long path, the passage of time will bring him to self-deception or frustration or disappointment or moral decline for his negative characteristics will rise and overpower him. The lack of preparation and development will prevent him from realizing in experience the high-level teachings he is trying to make his own, while the impossibility of balancing himself under such circumstances will upset or rob him of whatever gains he may still make. Chapter 8. Practices of the Short Path The short path is content with exercises done for their own sake, not for the sake of the results they bring. In this, it is the opposite of the long path, which does them for results and is attached to those results. There are three progressive stages in this technique. First, the student proves to himself, by following the master's guidance, that the ego is fictitious and illusory. Second, he concentrates diligently on short path meditation techniques to dig beneath the ego and escape from it. Third, he proves to himself the fact of non-duality, that there is only the one mind's existence. Different terms can be used to label this unique attainment. It is insight, awakening, enlightenment. It is being truth, consciousness is discrimination between the seer and the seen. It is awareness of that which is. It is the practice of the presence of God. 
It is the discovery of timelessness. All these words tell us something, but they all fall short and do not tell us enough. In fact, they are only hints for farther they cannot go. It is not on their level at all, since it is the touch of the untouchable. But never mind. Just play with such ideas if you care to. Ruminate and move among them. Put your heart as well as head into the game. Who knows? One day what may happen. Perhaps if you become still enough, you too may know, as the Bible suggests. The last phase of the short path has no special procedure, no specialized method. Life is its way, or as the Chinese sage said, usual life is very dull. Who am I? The question who am I is asked somewhere in that monumental ancient book, the Yoga Vashista. It was often included centuries later by St. Francis in his prayers. But Sri Ramana Maharshi gave it central importance in his advice to spiritual seekers and meditators. There is something in each man which says, I. Is it the body? Usually he thinks so. But if he could set up a deeper analysis, he would find that consciousness would carry him away from the body thought into itself. There, in its own pure existence, he would find the answer to his question, Who am I? Follow the I back to its holy source. If he will try to perceive the mind by which he perceives the world, he will be practicing the shortest, most direct technique of discovering the over-self. This is what Ramana Maharshi meant when he taught, trace the eye to its source. The ordinary kind of meditation seeks to escape from intellectualism at the very beginning, whereas the metaphysical kind uses it from the beginning. Even though it is analytic, it does not limit itself to cerebral activity. It conjoins feeling also, since it seeks an experience as well as an understanding. Therefore, in the Who Am I work, it moves with the whole being and with all its intensity. When you begin to seek the knower who is within you and to sever yourself from the seen, which is both without and within, you begin to pass from illusion to reality. Discover the stillness. He will understand the real spirit of meditation when he understands that he has to do nothing at all. Just sit still, physically, mentally, and emotionally. For the moment he attempts to do anything, he intrudes his ego. By sitting inwardly and outwardly still, he surrenders egotistic action and thereby implies that he is willing to surrender his little self to his over-self. He shows that he is willing to step aside and let himself be worked upon, acted through, and guided by a higher power. To the extent that a man keeps inwardly still, to that extent he unfolds himself and lets the ever-present over-self shine forth. In contemplating deeply nature's beauty around one, as some of us have done, it is possible to slip into a stillness where we realize that there never was a past but always the now, the ever-present timeless consciousness, all peace, all harmony that there is no past, just the eternal. Where are the shadows of negativity, then? They are non-existent. This can happen if we forget the self, with its narrowed viewpoint, and surrender to the impersonal. In that brief experience, there is no conflict to trouble the mind. The seeker after stillness should be told that the stillness is always there. Indeed, it is in every man but he has to learn first to let it in, and second, how to do so. The first beginning of this is to remember. The second is to recognize the inward pull. For the rest, the stillness itself will guide and lead him to itself. Continuous remembrance of the stillness, accompanied by automatic entry into it, is the sum and substance of the short path, the key practice to success. At all times, under all circumstances, this is to be done. 
That is to say, it really belongs to and is part of the daily and ordinary routine existence. Consequently, whenever it is forgotten, the practitioner must note his failure and make instant correction. The inner work is kept up until it goes on by itself. Every time he departs from the stillness, there is needed a warning awareness. This does not easily or normally come by itself, but by self-training, self-observation, mindfulness, the Buddha called it. The feeling for it has to be persistently nurtured, first brought into being, then preserved at all hours of the day and in whatever surroundings he finds himself. The spirit, Brahman, is not the stillness but is found by humans who are in the precondition of stillness. The latter is their human reaction to Brahman's presence coming into their field of awareness. By this simple act of unlearning all that you know, all that you have acquired, by thinking, by remembrance, by measurements, by comparison, and by judgment, when you return to the mere emptying of the consciousness of its contents, of thoughts and ideas, and when you come to the pure consciousness in itself, then only can you rest in the great silence. Witness His role is to play witness of what he is, how he behaves, the thoughts he admits, just as if he were witnessing someone else. This move over from the actively engaged person to the watcher is impersonal and disengaged even in the midst of action. It is one from drift to control. He must begin by putting the ego, his own ego, forward as an object of observation. He will not succeed fully in doing so because he is involved on both sides, as subject and object. But the direction can be fixed and the work can be started. With time and practice, study and reflection, help and sincerity, some sort of impersonality and neutrality can be established. When the inner stillness is fully reached, the work becomes much easier until it is completed by the grace of the higher self, over self. Of course, outside of meditation, he is conscious of his commonplace body, but he is also conscious of his awe-inspiring over self. He sees the first as part of a passing show himself as an uninvolved observer, and behind the both, the eternal over-self. To play the role of an observer of life, his own life, is to assist the process of inwardly detaching himself from it, and the field of observation must include the mental events, the thought happenings also, for mentalism shows that they are really one world. In the end, Everything belonging to experience belongs to mental experience. All this implies that matter is also a myth, unreal. Still more, it implies that ego is a myth, illusory. Here then is the first practice of the ultimate path. Think constantly of that mind which is producing the ego, all the other egos around, and all the world, in fact. Keep this up until it becomes habitual. The consequence is that one tends in time to regard his own ego with complete detachment, as though he were regarding somebody else. Furthermore, it forces him to take the standpoint of the all and to see unity as fundamental being. When a man has practiced this exercise for some time and to some competency, he will become repeatedly aware of a curious experience. For a few minutes at most and often only for a few moments, he will seem to have stepped outside his body and to be confronting himself, looking at his own face as though it were someone else's. Or he will seem to be standing behind his own body and seeing his face from a side angle. This is an important and significant experience. The position of the impersonal observer is only a tentative one, assumed because it is a practical help, perhaps midway toward the goal. For when it is well established in understanding, outlook and practice, something happens by itself. The observer and the observed ego with its body and world become swallowed up in the undivided mind. 
timeless reality. The exercise of trying to break through the mystery of time, which is a mental state into timelessness, which is not, belongs to the short path and is important, valuable, but admittedly difficult for beginners. It is practiced by confining the thoughts again and again during spare moments and brief leisurely periods to the meaning of timelessness, of the eternal now, and of the everlasting presence. The personal history which has gone before, let it really go and be free of the past which can become a mental prison for unwary persons. Learn to abide in the timeless, coming out of it as duties call, but holding on to it as the background. Our best time occurs when we forget the passing of time. Here, for those who can appreciate it, is a clue for the nature of real happiness. How can we win this freedom of timelessness? There is one way, and that is to step into the void and to stay there. We must find, in short, the eternal now. Wake from the dream. One special exercise of the short path is easily done by some persons and gives them excellent results, although it is hard to do by others. It consists in refusing to let remain any particular mental registration of the surrounding place or people or of any physical experience being undergone. Instead, the mental image is to be firmly dismissed with the thought, this too is like a dream, and then immediately forgotten. The exercise may be kept up for 15 to 20 minutes at a time. The practical benefit it yields is to give improved self-control. The metaphysical benefit is to weaken the sway of illusion. The mystical benefit is to enable him to take the stand of the witness attitude more easily, and the personal benefit is to make him a freer and happier man. Perceive these two things now, the dreamlike character of life in the world and the illusory character of the personal ego, hence the need of what am I, inquiry, that the illusion of the ego may be dispelled When you can see these things clearly, then you may be still and undisturbed, unentangled, and unillusioned amid the struggle of life. You will be wise, free, impervious to the petty persecution of men, their lies, malice, and injuries. For being is no longer identified with the personality. You are no longer their target. Past, present, future become mere dreams when considered against the background of that. If man could switch his thought of self over to the source and keep on identifying it with that, his consciousness would be transformed. Mind and Breath The would-be illumined person must conform to the double action of nature in him, to the outgoing and incoming breaths. So his illumination, when it happens, must be there and here, in the mind and in the body. The two together form the equilibrium of the double life we are called upon to live. That is, being in the world and yet not being of it. In the prolongation of the expiring breath, we not only get rid of negative thought, but also of the worldliness, the materialism of keeping to the physical interest alone. With the incoming breath, we draw a positive, inspiring remembrance of the divine hidden in the void. Hence we are there in the mind and here in the body. We recognize the truth of eternity, the act of time. We see the reality of the void, yet know that the entire universe comes forth from it. Remembrance One of the most valuable forms of yoga is the yoga of constant remembrance. Its subject may be a mystical experience, intuition or idea. In essence, it is really an endeavor to insert the transcendental atmosphere into the mundane life. The loving, adoring recollection of the over-self, the constant return to memory of it amid the world's distractions, the reiteration of this divine thought as a permanent background to all other thinking, is itself a yoga path. 
Indeed, it is the same as that taught by St. Paul when he wrote, Pray without ceasing, and bring every thought into captivity to Jesus Christ. Constant Remembrance Exercises The over-self is a term of which past experience may furnish no meaning. But perhaps you have had strangely beautiful moments when everything seemed to be still, when an ethereal world of being seemed very near to you. Well, in those moments you were lifted up to the over-self. The task you should set for yourself is to recapture that blessed presence and feel once again that beautiful interlude of unearthly stillness. If, however, you cannot recall such moments, or if, recalling them, you cannot again refresh your vividness and reality, then there is an alternative path. Make it your business to recall the picture and presence of some man whom you believe is awake to his over-self consciousness. Take him as your guru, and therefore as an outstretched hand which you can mentally grasp and by which you can gradually lift yourself. Thus, if the over-self is a vague abstraction to you, he, as a living person whom you have met, is not. He could easily be for you a definite focus of concentration, a positive point in the infinite to which you can direct your inward glance. This seemingly simple exercise is of universal availability, for it can be done wherever he wishes and whenever he wishes. There is no moment which does not offer a chance to practice it, no situation in which it is not opportune. All that he has to do is to remember that he is a quester, that he is also a divine being as well as an animal being, and that he must act from his whole manhood and not merely from a fragment of it. But this remembrance is not to be struggled for. It is to be established as a natural habit and a relaxing one, whatever the tensions around him. The more he practices, the more he can consolidate this way of life, this unique combination of acting in the world, as if he knew nothing more than worldly demands and being within himself quite detached from the world. The Over-Self Remembrance Exercise Name It is so simple that it is called an exercise only for name's sake. In the beginning it requires effort just like any other practice. How to 1. To be practiced at all times, in all places, under all bodily conditions. It consists of the constant loving recall to mind of the existence of and his inter-identity with the over-self. 2. It involves the repeated and devoted recollection that there is this other and greater self, a warm, felt, living thing, overshadowing and watching over him. 3. It should be continued until he is able to keep the thought of the over-self as a kind of setting for all his other thoughts. Glimpse If he has ever had a glimpse of the supersensuous higher existence which profoundly impressed him, and perhaps led him to take the quest, it is most important that he should also insert the remembrance of this experience into his exercise. He should try to bring as vividly as possible to his mind the sense of peace and exultation which he then felt. Warning. One danger of this remembrance exercise is that it can become too automatic too soon, and thus merely mechanical and hollow. The remembrance must be a warm, felt, living thing if the spirit of the exercise is to be retained and not lost. When to 1. The inward concentration should persist behind and despite outward activity. 2. The over-self remembrance should be held in the back of the mind, even though he may appear to be properly attentive to external matters. 3. He should keep the exercise always or as often as possible in the mind's background, while paying attention to duties in the foreground. 4. Though the foreground of his consciousness is busy attending to the affairs of daily living, its background abides in a kind of sacred emptiness, wherein no other thought may intrude than this thought of the over-self. 5. 
the remembrance should become the unmoved pivot upon which the pendulum of eternal activity swings perpetually to and fro. Free time. When he has free time, it should come to the fore. Every time there is relaxation from duties, he should let attention fly eagerly and more fully back to it. How long? He should train himself in this exercise. One, until it becomes quite easy and effortless. Two, until this inward concentration has been set in habitual motion. Three, until the remembrance continues of its own accord. Four, until its practice has become firmly and successfully established as ceaseless flow. Five, until the loving recall to mind of the existence of and his inner identity with the over-self becomes constant. Six, until the practice is absorbed in perfect and perpetual performance. Seven, until he experiences the over-self unceasingly as the unannounced and impersonal center of his personal gravity. Potency This method has a peculiar potency of its own despite its informal and unprogrammed character. Its unexpected effectiveness is therefore not to be measured by its obvious simplicity. Grace When the remembrance becomes ceaseless flow, the overself will bring him a remarkable fruitage of grace. When he turns habitually inwards toward the over-self, grace can operate more readily in all matters. When the grace starts working, this is likely to remove a number of internal and external obstacles in his path, sometimes in a seemingly miraculous manner, and eventually bring him to a truer self-awareness. Until it is brought to his attention, he may not know that the idol at whose feet he is continually worshipping, is the ego. If he could give to God the same amount of remembrance that he gives to his ego, he could quite soon attain and become established in that enlightenment to which other men devote lifetimes of arduous effort. By thought the ego is made, by thought the ego's power can be unmade, but the thought must be directed toward a higher entity. For the ego's willingness to attack itself is only a pretense. Direct it constantly to the over-self. Be mentally devoted to the over-self. And emotionally love the over-self. Can it then refuse to help you? The basis of this exercise is that the remembering of the over-self leads in time to the forgetting of the ego. To let the mind dwell constantly on the thought of the over-self tranquilizes it. To bring the figure of the spiritual guide into it strengthens it. To keep up this remembrance all the time, in all circumstances, requires practice and perseverance to an extent that seems beyond the ordinary. But they are actually within everyone's untapped resources and untouched reserves. Fix the attention undividedly upon the over-self which is anchored in your heart's center. Then everything you do during the day will naturally be divinely inspired action and true service. The over-self is your true source of power. Turn towards it and receive its constructive guidance for your task of daily living. Whether his body finds itself among the thieves or his mind finds itself among theories, the aspirant's duty of being aware ever remains paramount. He may work in the home, the office, or the field, and this activity should be quite compatible with holding on to the higher consciousness through practice of this recollection exercise. The latter need not get in the way of his ordinary faculties or perceptions. He is wrong to object that you can't hold two different thoughts at the same time and hence you can't remember God and attend to worldly details simultaneously, you can. God is not a thought, but an awareness of a higher level. Mind does not hold God. Certainly mind can't have two objects of thought, for they are in duality, but they can be held by God's presence. Only here is the union of subject and object possible. All other thoughts are in duality. 
in remembrance, he should once again love the beauty and revere the solemnity of his experience. If the effort to remember the over-self is kept up again and again, it attenuates the materialistic mental tendencies inherited from former lives and arrests the natural restlessness of attention. It eventually achieves a mystical concentration of thoughts again in character to that reached during set periods of meditation, but with the added advantage of not stopping the transaction of worldly activity. Moments of utter inward stillness may come to him. The ordinary familiar ego will then desert him with a lightning-like suddenness and with hardly less brevity. Let him fix these moments firmly in his memory. They are to be used in the ensuing years as themes for meditation and goals for striving. He must think as often and as intently of the overself as an infatuated girl thinks of the next appointed meeting with her lover. His whole heart must be held captive, as it were, by this aspiration. This is to be practiced not only at set formal times, but also constantly throughout the day, as an exercise in recollection. This yoga, done at all times and in all places, becomes a permanent life and not merely a transient exercise. This practice of constant remembrance of the over-self purifies the mind, and gradually renders it naturally introverted, concentrates, and eventually illumines it. This act of recollection requires no effort, no exercise of the power of will. It is an act of turning in, through, and by the power of love toward the source of being. Love redirects the attention, and love keeps it concentrated, sustained, obedient. Although, when feeling a descent of the stillness, the aspirant is told to drop whatever he is doing and to hold himself in the stillness as long as he can or as long as it is there, he may also practice a useful exercise entirely of his own initiative at any time of the day, involving a similar mental and physical posture. For this purpose, he holds whatever he is doing, whenever he wishes, and as often as he wishes and keeps himself suspended, as it were, not moving, not thinking of anything else except the passive remembrance of the over-self. This special exercise of remembrance may be done for a single minute or for a few, just as he wishes. By keeping close to the over-self, he can gain its protective guiding or helpful influence. No day should pass without its remembrance. No enterprise should be begun without its invocation. If the past is unredeemable and the future unpredictable, what more practical course is open than to safeguard the present by constant remembrance of the divine? No amount of exaggerated homage to a guru can take the place of remembering the real. The successful philosopher is no dreamer. He keeps his practicality, his interest in worldly affairs, his willingness to accept responsibility, thus remaining an effective servant of mankind. But all this is done within the remembrance. As if identity exercise. Better than any long drawn yoga discipline is the effort to rivet one's attention on the here and now of one's divinity. A part of the practical technique for attaining the inner awareness of this timeless reality is the practice of the as-if exercise. With some variations, it has already been published in The Wisdom of the Overself, and an unpublished variant has been included in descriptions of the short path as identification with the Overself. The practitioner regards himself no longer from the standpoint of the quester, but from that of the realized man. He assumes, in thought and action, that he has nothing to attain because he bases himself on the Vedantic truth that reality, of which he is a part, is here and now, is not reached in time, being timeless, and that therefore he is as divine as he ever will be. He rejects the appearance of things, which identifies man only with his ego, and insists on the higher identification with over-self also. 
On this short path, he searches into the meaning of being, of being himself, and of being in itself, until he finds its finality. Until the search is completed, he accepts the truth passed down to him by the enlightened ones, that in his inmost essence, he is reality. This leads to the logical consequence that he should disregard personal feelings, which continue from past tendencies, habits, attitudes, and think and act as if he were himself, an enlightened one. For now he knows by evidence, study, and reflection that the over-self is behind and is the very source of his ego. Just as he knows by the experience of feeling during his brief glimpses, Bringing this strong conviction into thought and act and attitude is the heavenly way or as if exercise, a principal one on the short path. He pretends to be what he aims to become, thinks, speaks, acts, behaves, as a master of emotion, desire, ego, because he would be one. But he should play this game for and to himself alone not to enlarge himself in others' eyes, lest he sow the seed of a great vanity. Identity Exercise He will not have to struggle as long on the long path. There will no more be irksome effort. The mind will be glad to rest in this positive state if he holds, from the very beginning, the faith that it already is accomplished, that the aspiration toward it is being fulfilled now not at some unknown distant time. Such an attitude engenders something more than pleasant feelings of hope and optimism. It engenders subconscious power. He shapes himself into another person in imagination, in faith, and in will. For while he creates the illusion of a new destiny, accompanying this new person, is this not a veritable rebirth? Does he not get away from the old everyday person and forget him utterly through this miraculous transformation? He lives so completely in this visualized ideal self that there is no space left for the old faults, the old weaknesses to creep in. He learns that he may set his own limits, that so long as he thinks all day that he is only this person, doing and speaking in the ordinary way what men usually do, then he is certainly nothing more. But if he starts the day on a higher level, thinking that he is divine in his inmost being, and keeps on that level as the hours pass, then he will feel closer to it. This is a practical procedure, one which has its effect on consciousness, on character, and on events. The method of the short path is to affirm that in the heavenly consciousness of the over-self, there is no evil, no wrongdoing, no sinfulness, and no faultiness, and that because the true being of man is there, the aspirant should identify himself with it in faith, thought, and vision. In that threefold way he sees himself dwelling and acting in the overself, and therefore without his specific sins and faults, he regards them as non-existent and drops anxiety or concern about them. He does this as much as he can from morning to night, and this fulfills Jesus' injunction to pray without ceasing, in a deeper and philosophical sense. It is a vision of himself as he could be, but transferred from future possibility to present actualization. This identity exercise rightly belongs to the short path, for in the case of a beginner, whose knowledge is small, efforts limited, and character unpurified, its practice could be self-deceptive. The identity exercise is a changeover from humbly aspiring to a higher level to creatively imagining oneself as being there already. The dangers here are conceit, deceit, and complacency. The as-if exercise is not merely pretense or make-believe. It requires penetrative study and sufficient understanding of the high character and spiritual consciousness in the part to be played, the role to be enacted, the auto-suggestion to be realized. This 
practice of picturing oneself as one ought to be, of visualizing the man free from negative qualities and radiant with positive ones that are part of the quest ideal, has near magical results. To practice the as if short path exercise successfully, it is necessary to let go and forget all past techniques and begin afresh. They are attachments, and to that extent, distractions. They may cause self consciousness, anxiety for success, and impatience. The divinity is there within you. Have faith that it is so, and entrust yourself to it. Practice of the as if exercise is like being spiritually reborn and finding a new way of life. It gives courage to those who feel grievously inadequate, hope to those who feel hooked by their past failures. Even if it only be a pose that is cultivated, it still remains a valuable discipline and exercise which gives good results, for it has much suggestive power, this as-if method, and is an essential part of the short path. Into the Void Meditation on the void has, as one of its chief aims, the overcoming of egoism. It not only destroys the narrow view of self, but sublimates the very thought of self into the thought of pure, unbounded existence. Employed at the proper time and not prematurely, it burns up the delusion of separateness. The highest and the last of the inward-bound stages is still to be reached. And this is the self, knowing void of being which can repeat the phrase, I am that I am, of Exodus 3.14, but which is without any other predicate. Not until the ego is completely deflated and falls into the void will he know, feel, and fully realize the blissfulness of salvation. At this point he gets so lost in the void that he forgets who it is who is meditating, then and thus he receives a further answer to the question, Who am I? When all action comes to an end, when the body is immobile and the consciousness stilled, there is achieved what the Chinese have called Wu Wei, meaning non-doing. This brings a wonderful peace, for tied up with it is non-desiring and not aspiring The quester has then come close to the end. But until this peace is thoroughly and permanently established in him, the quest must go on. Let go of all negative thoughts, especially those which concern others. Cease from condemnation and criticism, except where it is a necessary part of one's obligation, duty, or position in the world, such as a magistrate's. Through repeated contemplation of the void, the mind rids itself of the illusions of matter, time, space, and personality, and eventually the truth is reached. Why be afraid of this declaration, that the final goal is to merge in the absolute? Is it because it promises the same as death, annihilation? Yet whenever deep sleep is entered, this merger happens. The ego with its thoughts, desires, and agitations is gone. The world with its relativities is no more. Time, space, form, memory are lost. Yet all reappears next morning. So it is not a real death. It is pure being. Meditation tries to reproduce this condition to achieve a return to deep sleep but with the added factor of awareness. In the final phase, Nirvikalpa Samadhi, it succeeds. Man dissolves but his divine source remains as the residue, as what he always and basically was. This is why philosophy includes meditation. It would be completely false to regard the void as being a nothing and containing nothing. It is being itself, and contains reality behind all things. Nor is it a kind of inertia, of paralysis. All action springs out of it. All the world forces derive from it. We must withdraw everything and thought from the mind, except this single thought of trying to achieve the absence of what is not the absolute. This is called jnana yoga, neti neti. It is not this, as Shankar called it, 
and he must go on with his negative elimination until he reaches the stage where a great void envelops him. If he can succeed in holding resolutely to this void in sustained concentration, and he will discover it is one of the hardest things in the world to do so, he will abruptly find that it is not a mere mental abstraction, but something real, not a dream, but the most concrete thing in his experience. Then, and then only, can he declare positively, it is this, for he has found the over-self. A further result of this contemplation of the world as the great void is that the work done by mentalistic study is advanced still further. For not only are the things experienced by the five senses seen to be only thoughts, but thoughts themselves are now seen to be the transient spume and spray flung out of seeming emptiness. Thus there is a complete reorientation of thoughts to thought. Instead of holding a single thought or scenes of ideas in perfect concentration, the practiser must now move away from all ideas altogether to that seeming emptiness in which they arise. And the latter, of course, is the pure, passive, undifferentiated mind stuff out of which the separate ideas are produced. Here there is no knowing and discriminating between one idea and another, no stirring into consciousness of this and that, but rather a sublime vacancy. For the mind essence is not something which we can picture to ourselves. It is utterly formless. It is as empty and ungraspable as space. The final grade of inner experience, the deepest phase of contemplation, is one where the experiencer himself disappears. The meditator vanishes. The knower no longer has an object not even the over-self to know, for duality collapses. Because this grade is beyond the supreme light experience where the over-self reveals its presence visually as a dazzling mass, shaft, ball, or ray of unearthly radiance, which is seen whether the bodily eyes are open or closed, it has been called the divine darkness. Repose in this condition of vast emptiness is accompanied by intense and vivid happiness. He knows that he is with the living God. He understands that he has come as close to God as it is possible for a human being on earth to do so and yet remain human and alive. But he knows and understands all this not by the movement of ideas, for there are none here, but by the feeling which captures his whole being. But it is during this final experience of the void, when he passes beyond all relativity, that he experiences mind to be the only reality, the only enduring existence, and that all else is but a shadow. Entry into this stage is therefore a critical point for every aspirant. Hidden behind every particular thought, there exists the divine element which makes possible a consciousness of that thought. If therefore we seek that element, we may seek it first by widening the gap between them and then dissolving all thoughts, and second, by contemplating that out of which they have arisen. During the gap, infinitesimal though it may be, between two thoughts, the ego vanishes. Hence it may truly be said that with each thought it reincarnates anew. There is no real need to wait for the series of long-lived births to be passed through before liberation can be achieved. The series of momentary bursts also offers this opportunity, provided a man knows how to use it. There are certain intervals of consciousness between two thoughts, such as those between waking and sleep, and those between sleep and waking, which normally pass unobserved because of the rapidity and brevity associated with them. Between one moment and another, there is the timeless consciousness. Between one thought and another, there is a thought-free consciousness. It is upon this fact that a certain exercise was included in the wisdom of the Overself, which had not previously been published in any Western book. But it is not a modern discovery. It was known to the ancient Egyptians. It was known to the Tibetan occultists. And in modern times, it was probably known to Krishnamurti. 
The Egyptians, preoccupied as they were with the subject of death and the next world, based their celebrated Book of the Dead upon it. The Tibetan Book of the Dead contained the same theme. Between the passing out of the invisible vital force's body at the end of each incarnation and its entry into that state of consciousness which is death, the same interval reappears. If the dying man can lift himself up to it, seize upon it, and not let it escape him, he will then enter into heaven, the true heaven, and it was to remind him of this fact and to help him achieve this feat that the ancient priest attended his last moments and chanted the pertinent passages from these books. This mysterious interval makes its appearance throughout life and even at death. And yet men notice it not and miss an opportunity. It happens not only at the entry into death, but also in between two breaths. It is possible to go even further and say that the interval reappears for a longer period between two incarnations, for there is then the blocking out of all impressions of the past prior to taking on a new body. Plato must have known it. The succession of thoughts appears in time, but the gap between two of them is outside time. The gap itself is normally unobserved. The chance of enlightenment is missed. It is the presence of the physical ego in the wakeful state that paralyzes all spiritual awareness therein. It is the absence of the personal and physical ego in the deep sleep state that paralyzes all material awareness therein, too. By keeping it out and yet keeping in wakefulness, the transcendental consciousness is able to provide the requisite condition for an unbroken spiritual awareness that is not only superior to the three states, but continues its own existence behind theirs. They may come quite abruptly, those intently lived moments of true vision, those spasmodic glimpses of a beauty and truth above the best which earthly life offers. The mind then rests and there is a gap in its usual activities, a void out of which these heavenly experiences come to life as they overcome our ordinary feelings. Students draw back affrighted at the concept of a great void which leaves them nothing, human or divine, to which they may cling. How much the more will they draw back, not from a mere concept, but from an actual experience through which they must personally pass? This is an event, albeit not the final one, on the ultimate, ultra-mystic path, which they can enter which they can neither avoid nor evade. It is a trial which must be endured, although to the student who has resigned himself to the acceptance of the truth, whatever face it bears, who has consequently comprehended already the intellectual emptiness of both matter and personality. This experience will not assume the form of a trial, but rather of an adventure. After such a rare realization, he will emerge a different man. Henceforth, he will know that nothing that has shape, nobody who bears a form, no voice, save that which is soundless, can ever help him again. He will know that his whole trust, his whole hope, and his whole heart are now and forevermore to be surrendered unconditionally to this void, which mysteriously will no longer be a void for him, for it is God. The first contact of the student with the void will probably frighten him. The sense of being alone, a disembodied spirit in an immense abyss of limitless space, gives a kind of shock to him, unless he comes well prepared by metaphysical understanding and well fortified by resolve to reach the supreme reality. His terror is, however, unjustified, in the act of projecting the personal ego, the overself has necessarily to veil itself from the ego at the same time. Thus, ignorance is born. Those who find that beyond the light they must pass through the void, the unbounded emptiness, often draw back affrighted and refuse to venture farther. For here they have naught to gain or get, no glorious spiritual rapture to add to their memories no great power to increase their sense of being a co-worker with God. 
Here, their very lifeblood is to be squeezed out as the price of entry. Here they must become the feeblest of creatures. So many mystics are quite unnecessarily frightened by this concept of the void that it is necessary to reassure them. They halt on the very threshold of their high attainment and go no farther, because they feel that they will be extinguished, annihilated. The truth is that this will happen only to their lower nature. They themselves will remain very much alive. Thus, it is not the best part of their nature which really dreads the experience of the void, but the worst part. What is called Turiya, or the fourth state in Sanskrit, although it is neither waking, dreaming, nor sleeping, is related, however, to all three as their background. Therefore, before one falls asleep, it comes into play. Before one wakes up in the morning, it also comes into play. Or before a dream comes to an end and deep sleep supervenes, it comes into play. This is why either the practice of meditation or the brief practice of spiritual remembrance at any of these three natural pause periods takes the fullest advantage of them. This is also why during the interval between two separate thoughts, it comes into play. Thus, throughout a man's life, he's comfortably being brought back into touch with his divine self. But because his face is turned the other way and he's looking in the wrong direction, he never takes advantage and becomes aware of that self.